Okay, well, good afternoon. I think we'll, we'll get started. So uh, today's discussion, as you know, is on HIV. Uh, I suspect that, at least when I talk to many uh, younger uh, graduate students who come to our lab and so forth, uh, they didn't live through the initial periods of HIV. And so it tends to be like a symphony where you're only tuning in at the third movement. But it's really uh, the first movement or two that gives, it seems to me, and in reading more, a reflection on not only a disease and the search for an agent, but on society itself. Uh, in the beginning, like in the Middle Ages, when the etiology was unknown, uh, by and large, the people who had it uh, were almost blamed. And it was even referred to <coughs> as retribution for some social behavior. Uh, there was what was euphemistically called the 4-H club which stood for male homosexuals, heroin abusers, hemophiliacs, and the other H is... Haitians. Haitians, right. Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, each of those groups, not so much the hemophiliacs, they came along sort of later, but certainly the, the homosexual community, the drug abusers, uh, this led to a social denial on the part of those who lived on the north side of the railroad tracks, so to speak. And I've often wondered, I know you go to Europe and even in parts of Asia today and you listen, turn on the television set, and there's fantastic public education, even, you know, for children of uh, uh, presenting... Uh, dancing condoms with explanations of what they are. And I mean, they've reduced to a level of acceptance in daily life. And our society uh, was extremely reluctant and to some extent still is to bring this kind of public awareness uh, out for everybody. And AIDS is, a, is an incredible example of uh, the diversity and rigidities and problems that that we confront. It's also a great example of, I don't know, probably one of the greatest medical scientific accomplishments uh, ever. Uh, an epidemic that was killing young people. I know in our hospital in New York, my gosh, there were always uh, a handful of young men dying of pulmonary disease, which was very strange, which we'll hear more about. And, uh, nobody knew anything about it, but nobody did anything about it until things changed. So we're going to hear through our first speaker today, Henry Mazur, uh, who took his medical training in uh, New York and has been at NIH for a long time and is the director of the critical care uh, uh, department at the clinical center. Uh, and he participated in some of the early descriptions of the infectious diseases that are a consequence of HIV infection. And more recently has been involved in studies of the major epidemic site in the United States for HIV, which tragically enough is uh, our parts of Baltimore and our nation's capital. So you can ask, surrounded by great institutions of learning and vast investments of public funds, how can it happen? I forget what the percentage was of people walking around the street in certain districts of the city and in Baltimore. I think it's 5%, was it? are HIV positive. Any rate, 
we're going to hear from Henry about that aspect and the status of uh, the Baltimore, Washington uh, epidemic. And then our second speaker is uh, John Coffin, uh, who gets the medal for longevity. John <laughs> and I have been colleagues at Tufts more than 12 years ago, uh, where he was involved in a similar kind of course that we had there. And each year, except for one, since we've had this program, uh, John, who's a leading retrovirologist, has talked about the viral mechanisms and how the paradigms seem to be almost continuously changing and what the status is of where we are now and what we can look for in the future from the standpoint of the virus and to some extent the host. So we're very grateful to both of you for presenting this uh, discussion this afternoon. Well, thanks. Actually, I think Wayne has given a very nice synopsis of my talk. So any of you who just want the bottom line, I think you've heard it. Uh, you come back for when John uh, talks. Uh, but uh, I'm pleased to uh, come and give this talk. And as I look out in the audience, uh, I see that uh, Zion could probably give this talk because she's heard this before. Uh, or Sean could come and give uh, this talk. But uh, they can make some comments at the end. But it is an interesting history of HIV for those of you who are the age of Wynne and uh, me who lived through the early part of this, and those of you who have no recollection of the early part of this, because it really has been a tremendous transition. And I think that being at NIH, you know, we often don't appreciate the contributions of the institutions we work at, but it really is dramatic how many major contributions were made by scientists in the NIAID and the Cancer Institute in heart, lung, and blood in the clinical center. There really is a lot of the history of HIV here. And as I'll summarize very, very briefly, it really is a dramatic story that while there are many, many tragic deaths due to HIV, the progress that was made was really stunning, considering the fact that when the first case was seen in 1979, very few people understood what a retrovirus was. Very few people had any concept that retroviruses could cause disease in humans. John Coffin will probably come up and say that that was his theory all along. Uh, but uh, it really was not clear, and it was impressive how much information came out. But for those of us who are alive and practicing medicine in the late 1970s or early 1980s, it really was a stunning occurrence that we began to see patients in New York, where I was, in San Francisco and Los Angeles, like the patient in this slide, who would come in primarily with mucocutaneous candida, with candida esophagitis, with pneumonia. And they would turn out to have pneumonias or esophagitis or meningitis due to organisms that we never would have thought would occur in people who appeared to be immunologically normal. Now, in this era, all of you work at NIH, many of you are studying immunodeficiencies. It seems natural to wonder every time somebody has an unusual infection, why do they have it? But in that era, these were, more, these were really conceived of as interesting case reports. You had somebody with Mycobacterium avium. You had somebody with pneumocystis. The tools were really not there, nor was the mindset to look in a very complex way at why people developed this. So it wasn't in many ways until either childhood immunodeficiencies were a focus or until this epidemic occurred that this became a much more intensive science. And when patients in New York began to come in and turn out to have pneumocystis pneumonia, it was interesting to see that in the US up until this time, there were only about 70 cases of pneumocystis in adults per year. And suddenly, in the coastal cities, there would be 70 patients in a month. So the question was, why was this? And while it's intuitively obvious to you to look at their, uh, their immunity to see whether this is an immunodeficiency, there were many theories then as to whether certain pathogens like pneumocystis or cryptococcus or mycobacterium had mutated and become more virulent, 
or whether there was some environmental issue that was altering our immunity, or whether there was some infectious agent. And when the infectious agents were discussed, the question was, was this something related to uh, sex? Was it due to uh, mycoplasma? Was it due to viruses? Was it due to fungi? People really had no idea. So this really was a mystery. And in the beginning of the epidemic, much of the information was not in the peer-reviewed literature because the peer-reviewed literature was even slower then than it is now. So there were many things in things like the CDC's morbidity and mortality, which for those of you who aren't in the field of infectious disease, is a periodical that comes out once a week. Uh, there are reports that the CDC has investigated around the country, this data, but it's a way for a rapid dissemination of information. So there was information coming out about opportunistic infections in Kaposi sarcoma, about pneumocystis in individuals with hemophilia, about disease in infants in New Jersey, California, New York, and it was really a mystery as to what all these individuals had in common. The concept that this could be due to a communicable disease, that this could be due to a bloodborne pathogen that could be transferred from mother to child by IV drug abuse, uh, by heterosexual sex or homosexual sex, was something that really had to evolve. So it's difficult in this era where AIDS is something that we've all lived with for 35 years to imagine both the uncertainty that occurred then and the interest in how quickly this spread. Because at first it wasn't clear whether these were simply a few cases, but as the number of cases increased over the next few years, there was really a major concern in the lay literature and in public health authorities as to what was causing this. And the question really was, who was going to investigate this? And I did not immediately jump into this. The CDC did not immediately jump into this. The question at first was, what should the federal government do? And to be fair, the CDC was tracking this from the very beginning. Tony Fauci very quickly indicated that he was interested in this, and he wanted NIH to have a program. But the question really was, how much of an investment should we put into this? Because it wasn't really clear whether this was a small problem that would be a curiosity or a large problem. Now, I remember when I first sent in the report that was the first report from New York to the New England Journal, I heard from various senior people that the editors of the New England Journal wanted to know, number one, who were we that were reporting this? Did we really know what we were doing? Were these really cases of pneumocystis and cryptococcus? Was all this credible? Because they were skeptical that this was a real entity, but in fact, it obviously uh, was. One of the things that really galvanized the federal government to make more of an investment was the patient group that was most effective, namely gay men. They were an incredibly effective advocacy group. And without them, NIH and the CDC would not have gotten the funds from Congress in order to escalate the efforts as much as they did. And I think that the gay community was appropriately angry that there was very little discussion. This is Wynn said, the discussion about sex, the discussion about homosexuality was not nearly as open as it is now. And I don't know if any of you uh, have uh, seen um, uh, the um, uh, recent movie Buyer's Club. Have, ever, have any of you seen that? No, a few of you. But I think that's really a great um, recreation of what the environment was when this uh, uh, cowboy in Texas gets HIV. He thinks this only happens to homosexuals. He doesn't understand why this could happen to him. His friends all shun him. And then the question is, what is it that we're going to do about it? And he's very angry that there aren't drugs available for him. So it was really the gay community that had a very big presence. And to their credit, they made noise not just about gays, but about everybody who had HIV. So they were inclusive, whereas many other groups were not inclusive of them. So there was a lot of political turmoil while interested scientists began to develop programs to understand this. And I think even at NIH, NIH was a much more interesting place in many ways in the early 1980s 
because number one, we didn't have a fence. So that if you wanted to get on campus, you could get on campus. And there were groups that took advantage of that. And there were demonstrations in front of Building 1. Uh, there were uh, 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 threats to close Building 31. Uh, as you can see, there were uh, fireworks, so to speak. So while this was somewhat intimidating, I think this did galvanize a lot of people to put more money and put more effort into it. And it really escalated the investment that NIH put into both extramural and intramural research. This was also an era where people were frightened and didn't know what to do. So while people like John Coffin were beginning to study retroviruses, maybe by then, John, you, were you already studying retroviruses then? You were already. Yeah, all right, but other things. Uh, while people were beginning to study this, the question for the clinicians was, you had these patients with pneumocystis, you had these patients with cryptococcal disease, most of them were dying within 9 to 12 months of their first presentation with the disease. So this was frightening. It wasn't clear how this was transmitted. And it wasn't clear what to do about this because, first of all, at first we didn't know this was due to a retrovirus. And then once we knew it was a retrovirus, we didn't have any drugs to treat retrovirus. And it's interesting that a lot of focus was whether we should try to be empiric or whether we should try to have a program based on science. And again, I think it is to the credit of people like Tony and David Kessler at the FDA that there's a lot of evidence saying, let's not approve drugs, let's not approve tests unless we know that they're effective. And in the Buyers Club and in the literature there, there was a lot of emphasis on what it was we had to do. There were drugs that, quote, worked. Why couldn't we get one? And this guy in the Buyers Club, is, has contacts in Europe, has contacts in other places. We're getting him drugs. And probably no one here other than Wynn remembers uh, who this was, but uh, Rock Hudson was uh, you know, one of the leading men in uh, film in that era. And since he was clearly heterosexual in all the films, it was a big shock when it turned out that he was homosexual and he had AIDS. And this is what he looked like when he had AIDS. And one of the dramatic stories was that there were a number of drugs like HPA-27, uh, like dextrin sulfate. Um, there are a whole series of drugs which were clearly effective in clinical trials in Europe, and yet the FDA would not allow people to have it. So the question was, why would the FDA not allow people to have it? Well, Rock Hudson went to Europe to get this, and there was a very, I, I've never been able to find the picture again, but there's a very, uh, uh, impressive picture in uh, time back then of Rock Hudson being carried on the way to France on a stretcher, and then four weeks later, after getting HPA 27, coming back from France, walking down the uh, uh, stairway. So clearly, this was a big insult to the scientific community here because we did not allow people to get HPA 27. Now, the unfortunate follow up is he died about two weeks later. Um, so the fact was that these drugs were not effective. So what we needed was a rational drug development process, not a slapdash effort uh, to make things available that could be toxic and were not necessarily effective. And just to follow up on that, one of the first drugs that was used here, which was widely thought to be effective, was something called Suramin. Now, Suramin ultimately has been used because it turned out it causes such dramatic adrenal insufficiency that patients died of adrenal insufficiency, but then they started using it for adrenal carcinoma because it was so effective. So the point was, there were drugs which not only were not effective, but were also harmful. So this was an era where we didn't understand what was going on. There was fear in the community. There was a lot of agitation to get the process moving. Uh, and ultimately, it did. And I think it is, as Wynn said, dramatic that the list of accomplishments could be many, many slides. But it's amazing that in 1981, we had the first published results, or the first published description of patients with AIDS. In 1984, John Coffin will tell you who discovered the AIDS virus, whether it was uh, the French or whether it was Gallo. So John, are you going to tell us that? 1983, all right. Then 1984, 1985, after the virus was discovered, 
we had a serologic test. So for the first time, we could identify people who were not clinically ill. We could identify people with early disease, and we could start doing uh, epidemiologic studies to understand transmission. We quickly learned how to do monitoring of immune function. CD4 has turned out to be an extraordinarily effective test to see how susceptible people were to infection. Actually, it is almost uniquely effective in uh, patients with HIV. It's not nearly as good as any other disease. Yeah, you had a question? How were the patients, how were the cases identified? It was based on phenotype. In other words, if you had an unusual infection and you didn't have an obvious reason, then you were assumed to have AIDS. So for instance, if you had pneumocystis pneumonia, you'd never been ill, you had cryptococcal meningitis, that caused some misassignment. But that was basically the assumption. And then as we knew more about the epidemiology, if you were gay, if you were hemophiliac, that sealed it until we had a test. Well. Uh, T cell counts, um, John probably remembers the exact date. It was either 1987 or 1989. There was the first article in the annals, actually by Cliff Lane here, that correlated CD4 counts with the occurrence of opportunistic infection. They had been used before for prognosis in terms of longevity, but the whole association of susceptibility to infection took through the 1980s development. John, do you remember exactly when that started? So, I mean, it, it is impressive that it took longer than one might think to develop these assays, uh, both the viral load and the CD4. But they became extraordinarily important tools, obviously, for assessing prognosis and ultimately for doing care. But then, you know, AZ, after uh, the virus was uh, identified uh, in 1983, the first drug was approved in 1987, whereas you can say four years is a long time. For a new category of virus to go four years to the approval of a drug, not only to the, to the identification of a drug, but to the completion of a trial and the FDA approval of a drug, I think historically is pretty dramatic. And as we develop better and better therapy, we, we have really eliminated maternal to child transmission, bloodborne transmission by screening blood. Uh, there are almost no uh, needle stick injuries anymore. And we know how to prevent the transmission in, among IV drug abusers and sexually. It's just that changing behavior is something we've made very little progress on. And without going through the entire story of what went on, because I would like to focus on what we've been doing locally about HIV, it's also dramatic that the pharmaceutical companies responded once they understood what the agent was. And after AZT, there were a large number of drugs that were developed. So the first of all, the pharmaceutical companies responded not necessarily out of altruism, although that was possibly it, but we had a million people in this country with HIV. So there's a big market out there. As you know, they like markets where you have to take a drug lifelong. So this was a good market. They made drugs. And one of the major developments was, number one, that we developed much better agents than AZT. And then, because people had trouble tolerating these drugs, they had many side effects, uh, they had drug interactions, it was just hard to take these drugs several times a day. Really, I think one of the brilliant moves by John Martin of Gilead was to get three drugs that could be given with the same pharmacokinetic profile and put them in one pill so that suddenly people could take one well-tolerated pill and remember it once a day and adhere to that for a long period of time. And I think that the adherence issue is something we often underestimate. I think that if you think about how many times you've been given a week or 10 days of antibiotics, how many times you've actually completed that course, there's a big difference in uh, uh, how often you do that. So by the late 1990s, when we had all these drugs, there was a dramatic drop in the incidence of AIDS-defying opportunistic infections. So you looked at why people were sick, you know, they'd be getting CMV disease, they'd be getting pneumocystis, so this is CMV eye disease or uh, gastrointestinal disease, 
They were getting pneumocystis pneumonia. They were developing mycobacterium avium. The number of cases of these entities began to decline as more and more patients were taking antiretroviral therapy. So on the one hand, this was a major advance in terms of how well we were doing for people in care. But it was also interesting that while scientifically we were doing well, while for the people who could have access to care, they could do dramatically well and avoid the complications of HIV and ultimately live almost as long as their age-matched HIV-negative peers, we had two problems in the United States. One was, if you look at the annual incidence of HIV, in 2011, it was 50,000 cases. And what's interesting about that number is that while 50,000, you could say, is not as high as some things, if you look at the number of cases of HIV in the United States, there was some definitional problems. But we basically, since the 1980s, have not changed the incidence of HIV. It has been 50,000 uh, cases a year for the last 30 years. So this means that while we understand the science of HIV, we have not been able to change human behavior. So as Wynn says, in Europe and in Africa, they have much better educational programs about safe sex. Nowhere have they really been successful or have they been highly successful in reducing uh, uh, the rates of uh, HIV. I guess some African countries have been better. But in the United States, this has really not been a successful program in terms of reducing the number of patients who acquire this each year. The other thing that's interesting is if you look at the average CD4 count when we start antiretrovirals, what we would like to do is we would like to identify people early when their CD4 counts are high so that they never get complications. If we don't uh, identify them early, if we wait till their CD4 counts are low, they'll get complications and they won't do as well as if we identify them early. But it's interesting, with all of the emphasis we have in the United States on early testing, the average CD4 count when people start antiretroviral therapy in 1993 was about 300. And in 2011, it's only about 350. And this is just a way of saying we'd like to identify people at 500 or 600, but people are not getting tested enough. People aren't getting tested, and people are not getting access to care. So if you look at who has HIV and who suffers morbidity in the United States, there are two groups of people. There are those who are not getting tested, who are unaware of their HIV, they don't get tested, they don't identify themselves as in a risk group, or they don't have uh, access to care. They don't have insurance, they're afraid to go to a health care provider. They're the ones who show up in our uh, emergency rooms with opportunistic infections and with various AIDS-related cancers like Kaposi's sarcoma. We also, though, have a new group of patients who are aware of their HIV and who are virally suppressed. They take their drugs, they do well. But one of the things we're finding is that even though they, develop, they do not develop opportunistic infections, they don't develop lymphoma or Kaposi's sarcoma, they have more liver disease, they have more accelerated atherosclerosis, they have more renal failure, and they probably have a neurocognitive decline and this is due to a inflammation that is related to presumably low-level viremia. So we have one group that aren't treated who are developing the traditional AIDS-related complications, and another group that are well-treated that while they're living, they're developing other inflammatory complications which we need to understand and deal with. So one of the questions is, what do we do about it, and what does NIH do about it? NIH has a robust scientific um, a project which is trying to understand HIV better, which would like to eradicate HIV. But the question as NIH is, is there something we should do operationally? And operationally, NIH has never gotten involved in how do you improve the delivery of health care. But when you see how badly so many places are doing in terms of delivering care, the question is, could we do more? And I think that the, the story in D.C. has led us to want to do more research to understand how we can treat this disease better. Now, we all recognize that here at NIH, we live near Washington, D.C., which has a surprisingly small population of about 500, 580,000 people, so it's a manageable city. But in 2007, an important event occurred, and that is 
that Washington was the only city nationally that had never reported its HIV rate. And the reason it had never reported its HIV rate is that the city health department was not well funded, was not well staffed, and all their data was in boxes. It's just that nobody had ever looked at it. So when the Fenning administration came in, they brought in some new public health uh, leadership. They put the data together with Alan Greenberg at the GW School of Public Health, and they published this report, which was really dramatic because it showed that Washington, D.C. had the highest rate of HIV of any city in the United States. And in fact, if you looked at the rate, it was clearly an epidemic, and the Washington Post and the New York Times said that this was a epidemic in our nation's capital in 2007. And if you looked at the rate and compared it to some countries in Africa where we provide uh, care, these are all PEPFAR countries, countries where, the, where President Bush's emergency program for AIDS relief provides care. And while the rate among African Americans in DC at 5% is lower than some countries, it's higher than other countries where we give AIDS, so on an international scale, while Washington is a city and these are countries, Washington clearly had an embarrassingly high rate of HIV. So the question is, NIH is this close to the nation's capital. What is it that we do? Now, NIH is a research institution. We get our money appropriated to do research. We do not get our money appropriated to simply dole it out to municipalities and states to improve the delivery of health care. So everything we do has to be in the, uh, in the uh, mode of a research study. So we met with the DC Department of Health, and the question is, what kind of research could we do in DC that would serve as a model for the United States and for the world, and which could also help the DC government? So we worked out an arrangement, and this is Tony Fauci uh, uh, talking at the uh, kickoff, and this is uh, Adrian Fenty and his public health leadership here. And we decided on a program that would have four pieces. The first issue is, in order to understand the epidemic, just as the CDC collected data on the AIDS epidemic from the very beginning so that we understand who gets it, uh, where are they uh, getting it, um, uh, what are their characteristics, we decided that we would become the first city anywhere where we would have a citywide database that connected all the major providers with one database. So we got these major institutions, which I think you'd recognize the names of, George Washington, GW, the hospital center, plus community-based clinics. They all fortunately had an electronic database. And we have worked diligently, much like Obamacare, trying to get these uh, groups to communicate with, with each other. And then we got patients to agree with informed consent to have their data included in this database so that we can understand in the city exactly where the problem is, who's having a problem, and then which providers understand how to do care. We can look at individual clinics because we get all their data and see who is on approved antiretroviral, antiretroviral regimens and who is on ones that are a little hard to understand. Uh, who is on pneumocystis prophylaxis? Who's getting tested for sexually transmitted diseases? And we do that not so that we can be pejorative, but so that we can go to a clinic in Northeast, we can go to a clinic in Southwest and say, they need training, they need intervention, they need more help. And I think we are now about halfway to our goal. The acceptance in the city has been amazingly good for a city where there is traditional skepticism about medical research. We now have about 6,000 patients enrolled in the study. We think there are about 14,000 patients with HIV in DC, so we're about halfway there. The refusal rate has been very low. So the patients are getting this, whether they're the gay community, IV drug abusers, whether in Southwest or Northwest, patients understand the importance of this. And one of the important issues about the data is the data is uh, meshed with data from the DC Department of Health. Now, HIV is a reportable disease, and all the data that physicians get on HIV gets funneled to the DC Department of Health. So we know who's in our cohort, we know who is not in our cohort, and we can compare these groups and look to see where do we need to do more testing, 
Where do we need to get more patients into care? Where do we get patients to, to uh, be incentivized to stay in care? This will be a powerful tool. And while there are other cities where Johns Hopkins might have a great database for their patients, the University of Alabama might have a great, ba a great uh, database for their patients in Birmingham, there's no other city that can follow the entire city like Washington, D.C. So this is unique, and this is going to be a very valuable tool so that we will be able to do research and understand epidemiologic trends. The city will be able to improve the operationalization of their HIV care. I think this is going to be important. Another issue is that until uh, 2007, there were virtually no HIV prevention programs in D.C. There was no HIV prevention research at all. There were some controversial programs on needle exchange. But through funding from NIAID to the GW School of Public Health, we uh, enabled them to begin to participate in some of the NIAID networks so that suddenly, instead of Washington being excluded from prevention research, we took part in prevention research on what behavioral interventions and ultimately what um, antimicrobial uh, interventions would help with prevention. And Washington is now the number one city in terms of, or it's the number two city in terms of accruing patients into prevention trials, and the number one city in terms of patient, prevention, uh, patient uh, adherence to those protocols. So from being nowhere on the map, suddenly we have prevention programs. I think this is ultimately going to have an effect in the city. Uh, another problem we have in the city is building infrastructure. If you looked at the number of NIH grants for AIDS at GW, Georgetown, uh, Howard, and the Uniform Services, other than the VA and one grant that had been going on for a long time at Georgetown, there were no NIH grants in DC. So there was one women's study at Georgetown. The VA had some studies. Otherwise, there was nothing going on in DC. So another major advance in DC was for NIAID to fund one of uh, several dozen centers that they've had in the United States, but never one in Washington, DC, that funds infrastructure so that we could get more academic individuals to do basic, basic science research, do clinical research. And the importance of that is that once you start doing research, you bring other bright people into the city, uh, you get clinicians to pay more attention to some of the advances. So we think this is going to be a major advance in the city. And if you look at the number of starter grants and the number of faculty that Georgetown, GW, and Howard have brought into the city with the help of these starter grants, it is impressive. Uh, GW has brought uh, Doug Nixon from uh, University of California, San Francisco. Georgetown hired a new dean of nursing who's an HIV specialist. American University brought in uh, Chairman of Sociology who's interested in the effects of uh, gentrification on HIV rates. So suddenly there's more going on, and it's because of research funding. Another problem that we recognize in DC is we went and asked clinicians, what are your biggest problems in terms of HIV care? And they said, it is not providing antiretroviral therapy. That is a problem. But number one, we can do that. Number two, we don't need you competing with us uh, for things that were funded. What we have problems with is getting subspecialty care for mental health and for liver disease. And it's interesting that with liver disease, they recognize something which you can see here, that while HIV is a problem worldwide with 35 million uh, people, about a third of the cases in the US in particular are co-infected mostly with HCV, hepatitis C, or hepatitis B. And as the patients in care were better and better managed from an antiretroviral point of view, liver disease became one of the two leading causes of death. And that was largely because of hepatitis C. So that we said, all right, we will start a liver program so that while on the one hand we want to get more patients into care, on the other hand, we will also try to help you treat them with, uh, uh, for one of the major causes of death. And so saying, if you look in DC, the number of newly diagnosed patients in Washington, DC, hepatitis C is actually a much larger problem than HIV. So we have mono-infected people with hepatitis C. 
and we have co-infected people who have HIV and hepatitis C. And it's also interesting that if you look in the United States, because we're doing better in terms of treating patients with HIV, the deaths due to HIV are going up. I'm sorry, the deaths due to HIV are going down. The deaths due to hepatitis C are going up. Some of these are co-infected with HIV and uh, HCV. Some of HCV alone. So the clinicians were very prescient in saying, this is something we need to focus on so the patients who are in care don't die of their liver disease. And this actually occurred at a time when Sean Cardlil, who's sitting in the back, recognized that there were new drugs coming out. So it used to be that in order to treat um, uh, hepatitis C, you had to use injectable interferon uh, in addition to ribavirin and ultimately other drugs. But that an era was going to come because of new drugs where we could probably start treating people with all oral drugs so that the therapy was going to become much better tolerated and much more effective. And in fact, that is what's happening. So that if you look, first of all, at where hepatitis is, we decided we would try a new model. And instead of making patients come up to NIH, we established clinics in DC at areas where HIV and hepatitis were common. Uh, we found that most of the disease was, in fact, hepatitis C, some co-infected in blue, some mono-infected in red. There was a little bit of HPV. And we decided that what we would do is that we would use these drugs and try to develop regimens where we didn't have to use the injectable interferon. We didn't have to use seven pills a day. We would ultimately use regimens that were interferon and ribavirin free that went from seven pills a day to one pill a day and that went from 24 weeks to 12 weeks to shorter courses. And the fact is, Sean and his group working in these clinics, working with drug companies, have in fact gotten to the point where now we can do short courses. We can treat patients with six weeks of therapy, all oral, no injectable, very little um, uh, adverse effects, and have a cure rate in the high 90s. So that a major cause of morbidity and mortality in HIV for those who are treated, liver disease, is something that in 2014 we can treat. I think a lot of this work has been done in DC. A lot of it has been supported and performed by Sham and his group in NIAID. I think this is one of the real successes. And what we see as the future is that we're going to use the DC cohort to understand where the patients are who are not getting tested for HIV, to use the DC cohort to understand how to improve the performance of clinics, and then to focus on the major causes of death in those who are in treatment, namely hepatitis C. And we've established clinics. We would like to expand testing. And then ultimately, our real goal is that once we decide what the best regimen with these oral drugs are, that we would like to treat everybody in DC to see if rather than with HIV, where you have to treat people lifelong, with hepatitis C, you can treat people for four to six to eight weeks, presumably, and cure them. And if they change their behavior and don't get reinfected, then they're cured and avoid the problems. So this is an experiment we'd like to try in DC for hepatitis C. So I think if you look, go ahead, you got a question? Well, yeah, um, I mean, the, the funding is a complicated issue, but I think basically in DC, everybody who wants uh, uh, HIV treatment can get HIV treatment. There are various funding um, uh, mechanisms. Now, with new access to care, whether uh, Medicaid and DC Alliance are going to be able to afford all that, that's another issue. But I think fortunately, antiretroviral drugs are coming down in price. I thought you were going to ask about hepatitis C because one, of, yeah, because you know since there's more hepatitis C, one of the uh, sad facts is that the new regimens are going to be a thousand dollars a pill, one pill a day, hopefully. So a thousand dollars a pill, a thousand dollars a day, or sixteen hundred dollars a day is a lot, and then it makes a difference whether you're treating people for eight weeks or six weeks or four weeks. So these are going to be extraordinarily expensive. The question is, is it worth the cost? 
to get rid of the hepatitis so that they don't die of liver failure or they don't need a transplant. And that's a complicated social and economic question. But um, that's another issue. But I mean, money is going to be a big issue. But I think in 2014, to me, the major message before you hear the real science from John Coffin is that we've made tremendous strides from the fear and the lack of understanding we had in 1979 and 1981. We understand a lot, although not as much as we'd like to about HIV. We have regimens out there which can make HIV a long-term disease where your life expectancy is almost as good if you take your drugs as your HIV uninfected uh, uh, comparators. The problem, though, is that you do have accelerated inflammation. You develop accelerated heart disease, accelerated liver disease. We need to develop to, uh, the ability to understand and to treat that. With hepatitis, I think we have a major breakthrough. With some of the other issues, I think we need to understand more of the mechanism. But this has really been, I think, an amazing journey. But for those of you who are younger and entering into these fields, while a lot of the seminal work was done in the 1980s, we have a whole new set of problems now, understanding what happens to long-term patients and understanding how to eradicate HIV or to cure people of HIV. And hopefully in the next 45 minutes, John Coffin's going to tell you how we're going to do that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We have, please, some questions, comments, discussion? When it's an ID, uh, a senior ID fellow asking a question, I'll have to ditch the uh, question to somebody else. Dr. Cotillier, will you answer this? Oh, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Mazar. Thanks for your talk. It was very good. I just wanted to ask, oh, actually, to more make a comment, the fact that I think at least HIV is not only what we kind of don't mention as much is that HIV is not necessarily only about a virus, but it's also about kind of like social conditions and determinants that uh, like hyper segregated neighborhoods, also um, very limited sexual networks that continue to um, perpetuate and propagate this disease, and it's particularly in communities of color. And I, I wish that there was as much of an effort in terms of not only addressing the science behind it, but also the marginalization, the sustained poverty that continues to make this such a this epidemic and epidemic in certain communities. I don't think it's necessarily yeah. well, uh, uh, coincidental that we see this in particularly black communities, minority communities, underserved communities, impoverished communities. And I guess there's more than just, I guess it's not only the science behind it, but we need to have more of a political, I think, political will and actively De you know, deconstructing the, or addressing the issues that contribute, continue to contribute to this problem in minority communities. Yeah, no, I think that I think that is well said, and we certainly have most of the information we need to act on that. We just need to put more into the social and behavioral issues. And you know, one of the things in Washington is we're interested in finding out. We think we understand the dynamics of HIV in the city. I think once we have this database. And we do we compare we add to that some uh, molecular epidemiology. I think we'll understand more about what happens in Washington. But you're right, the marginalization and the social dynamics are something we have not invested enough in. So, so like men who have sex with men in the in in in. in particularly the black community, are there efforts to, especially in our younger, because I think it, what you talked about with ACT UP in the gay community in the 80s, I, I don't think it was ever translated necessarily in the black community, and I don't know if we necessarily have been, what kind of efforts or inroads are you making to try and, if any, are being made to, because we everyone knows DC is one of the big hubs for that in, the, in this community. What's being done, if anything? Well, just to make you know, a, a short answer, is one of the things that Alan Greenberg has gotten funded to do is to understand uh, or to, to start a cohort of black men and black women to try to interview them and gain their trust to understand what are the behaviors that lead to transmission of HIV. And obviously, we know what they are on one level, 
So the question is, do we really understand what the dynamics are? Do we understand the social networks? So I think that there are efforts, whether they're, I'm, first of all, the wrong person to ask about the breadth of the efforts nationally. But there are at least efforts. And locally, I think that is an interest of some of the people at GW. So Henry, is Washington, D.C. part of PEPFAR? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, when I was asked uh, questions uh, to be provocative, it was suggested uh, that D.C. be included in PEPFAR. And that was a politically very interesting uh, discussion. But no, it, it is not included in PEPFAR. Well, it wasn't meant facetiously, because that inclusion means that somebody is paying for the medication. Who's paying for the medications in the Washington area? Uh, you know, it's a combination of private insurers for those who are insured, uh, for uh, Medicaid for those who have Medicaid. And then DC, to its credit, is one of the few cities that has uh, a program for those who are between Medicaid and insurance called DC Alliance. So DC may have many problems, but they are pretty good about uh, HIV coverage. And unlike other states, as far as I know, there's never been a waiting list in D.C. for HIV medications. What about, what about HCV? Are they going to pay $1,000 a pill for? Uh, that that remains to be seen. I've asked Dr. Cotale, but I don't think anybody knows the answer to that uh, at this point. But obviously, uh, if, if a cure is going to be fifty dollars to $150,000, depending on whether you need one, two, or three drugs, that's going to be a huge investment. And if there are 14000 uh, patients in D.C., well, actually, they're probably more than that with hepatitis C. I guess somebody else can do the math as to how much money that's going to cost. Okay. Uh, any other questions? We'll have time. Let yes, please. The lower remia in um, people living with HIV and adhere to their meds. Can you say a little bit more about this? Does it come from the latency, the low viremia, or is it cells, active the, cells? This is a great segue it? because we're getting a little bit late. And it, you know, the perfect person to answer that, I, I know the most about that in the room. I'm going to refer to John Coffin. No, John Coffin is the perfect person to answer that, so he'll answer that. All right. So thank you very much, Henry. John, do you want to? I've got one here. No, actually, I got there's one on this too. I think it's good enough. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Wynn. I must have been doing this for about 20 years now or something. Not quite. Not quite. No, he's got to count on it. But it goes back, It goes back, of course, to when Wynn was um, uh, chair of physiology at Tufts University and instituted the course, which I still give lectures in every year, uh, which is the, the uh, forerunner of this one. Uh, there it's called pathophysiology. And it, it gathers every year about four to six graduate students. Uh, nobody watching online, so this is a quite quite a different uh, kind of experience here. So I want to uh, really change the course of of the discussion from talking about the the overall epidemic and the the the, uh, the, the tr uh, horrendous social problem still in dealing with it and dealing with a failing to decrease incidence and and in a sense look kind of into the future and ask what. As you probably all know, um, treatment for HIV infection, and as, do, as Dr. Mazur pointed out, treatment for HIV infection involves, to the delight of the drug companies, lifelong, lifelong therapy. And as I'll show uh, in, in some examples, if, if even after many, even after a decade or more of treatment, if that therapy is ended, the virus uh, simply returns and the disease picks up where, uh, where it left off uh, when therapy was started. And one of the issues that I, in collaboration with um, uh, this group in, up, up at NCI Frederick, the NIH group, um, have been working on for some years is, is what is the, the, the mechanisms of this persistence and what is the nature of the association of the virus with the host 
in individuals on long-term apparently successful treatment. And so we will uh, go, uh, so the, 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 um, this sort of summarizes the status of the, the, the problem. I'm sure you're all uh, pretty much aware uh, of these numbers. The only thing I really want to point to here, and this, this isn't very good, so I'll go to a, uh, yeah, um, is that uh, there's really uh, so far no cases of HIV infection that we know have been, pre pre have been prevented by any kind of vaccination. Um, there's not even a vaccine that's, um, well, there's, there may be a, a few cases possibly in one trial, um, but it's, it's statistically I don't think very robust. Um, there's been a lot of cases, particularly mothered infant transmission pre prevented by uh, chemoprophylaxis given to the infant. Um, and <coughs> or, or or to the mother, actually to the mother and infant at the time of, of, uh, of birth and before. And, um, and um, there is really only, although you'll read other, you may read differently in the newspapers and, and in, in the meeting reports and things like that, there's really only one clearly confirmed case of a person who's been cured of HIV infection. And, and that's, that's this person right here, Tim Brown, who's now uh, goes, has a, uh, is, is always being seen at meetings stumping for people to do more research on cure, which I think is a very fine thing. And I'm, in fact, quite pleased to, to help in this. I even share a margarita with him every once in a while. And um, he was, but he was cured by, uh, he was lucky enough, if you like, uh, to not only be HIV infected, but to also uh, have a hematopoietic malignancy for which the only uh, treatment that, that had any hope uh, was a bone marrow transplant. His physician in, in Germany um, had the insight to search among the bone marrow registry for individuals uh, who lacked a co-receptor necessary for infection with HIV and to uh, find such a donor and to transplant, uh, transplant him with cells uh, that had this mutation. And um, in fact, the, the, this is now, I think, five years ago or more, and the virus has not come back since. There's no sign of the virus whatsoever. He's been off therapy since about the time of the transplant and ever since. And presumably what has happened was a couple of things from the transplant. One was, of course, the ablation of, of the majority of, the of his own hematopoietic system, at least the stem cells, and the replacement with the donor stem cells, followed by a period of graft-versus-host disease, which served to clean out the rest of the his own cells, and then the total replacement cells that pretty much resisted the, uh, the virus that might have, any residual virus that might have been around. And, um, but this is the only successful case of this, um, uh, of this being done so far. It's not a treatment that can have very wide applicability, unfortunately. So, <clears throat> so let's get to the quick, quick molecular biology. HIV is a retrovirus. Being a retrovirus means it has an RNA genome like all viruses, it has to interact with the cell surface receptor to get into the cell. For the case of HIV, the cell surface receptor is a CD4 molecule, which also characterizes, not surprisingly, the target cells, CD4, mostly CD4 positive T cells. The RNA genome of the virus gets uh, reverse transcribed into a copy of DNA. That copy of DNA gets integrated into the uh, cell genome at more or less random sites. There is some specificity to this integration so that perhaps instead of the total target for integration of a HIV being 3 billion base pairs of the human genome, it's maybe 2 billion base pairs. It's still pretty random. Um, and this becomes important uh, in, in what I'm going to talk about at the end of this talk. So, um, but this means that once a cell is infected with, with HIV or any retrovirus, that retrovirus is forever in that cell as long as that cell lives. There's no good mechanism by which um, this, this provirus can be removed, and the cell becomes then permanently infected and permanently capable of producing uh, more virus un until it dies. In the case of HIV, the HIV itself will contribute to the death of the cell, either directly by some direct mechanism or also by uh, being spotted by the immune system and eliminated by uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, there's a number of important steps along here, such as the reverse transcription integrase, integration and proteolytic processing that's necessary for maturation of the virions at the end. And those have made 
form the important target sites for antiretroviral therapy, which is, as Dr. Mazur pointed out, is a um, one, one of the, and, and uh, Dr. Ares pointed out, is one, are, are, is one of the major success stories of 20th century um, medicine, actually. It's really quite remarkable uh, the, um, that this, this lethal disease was brought under at least partial control um, by the efforts of people here at NIH and elsewhere. So um, <coughs> just to run, run through some of the important points, that the important properties of the virus and the virus-host interaction, um, HIV is a retrovirus. It replicates then through stably integrated DNA intermediate, which is called the provirus. The replication cycle is somewhat error prone, so HIV accumulates diversity. I'm not, this has been a major focus, actually, what we do too, but I'm not going to talk about uh, this and its, its role, for example, in drug resistance. Uh, the integrated provirus, once it's there, replicates with the cell DNA and is genetically stable, so it can be considered to be around as long as the cell, will, as long as the cell lives and keeps dividing. The specific, a specific provirus can tag infected cell clones. So, for example, if a T cell is stimulated to, by antigen or something to clonally expand into large numbers, um, this, if, if it's been infected and is not killed by the virus, the provirus can tag that, and, and you can use that as a marker for, uh, for what had to have been a single cell at the time of integration, because the probability of seeing a provirus integrated at the same identical site in two, independently two cells is one in a billion or so. Um, so, <coughs> so, and expression of proviruses um, can also be regulated by chromatin structure and other epigenetic features. And this, if a provirus is, is otherwise capable of making virus but is suppressed uh, by such features, it's referred to as a latent provirus. The pro latent provirus one, which is not expressed, but which is capable of, under some conditions of becoming expressed again. Um, the course of replication also, errors during, that occur during the course of uh, making the provirus can also call, lead to dead proviruses, which also have these properties that they're not expressed, um, and they, they can tag cells forever, but they can't, because they're, they've suffered some kind of lethal mutation, they can't be, uh, ever be woken up again. And so they're, but they're hard to distinguish from latent proviruses or from proviruses on the infected cycle. And that's one of the challenges. Is, Scientific challenges is actually distinguishing viral DNA that comes from a latent provirus, comes from one that's being replicated, or one that is actually just sitting there dead and not doing anything. Um, <coughs> so, and, a, and a, another important point is that antiretroviral therapy is all directed at blocking infection and formation of the proviruses, but it has no effect whatsoever on cells that are already infected. So, this allows a long term survival of infection in long lived, latently infected cells as well as cells with defective proviruses. And a question that I will raise and, and begin to address at the very end is, can the provirus itself somehow affect the survival and growth of the cells, even if it's defective, even if it can't make viruses? Can, is there something about the way that proviruses can perhaps regulate transcription of the surrounding DNA, for example, that can affect survival and growth of cells mediated by integration sites? We have some rather surprising results on this point. Um, that I'll discuss at the very end. So, um, to go back now, at, in, in an HIV-infected individual, the virus sets up what is really quite a remarkable steady state. The virus infection is carried forward almost entirely by infection of cells that, by the virus that was made by cells that were just infected the day before and die. Every day, new cells get infected. That population of cells makes more virus. The cells that are making it die, the virus that goes on, then goes on to, uh, to infect a new generation of cells. And this process creates a steady state that's turned over that's remarkably stable. For years and years and years, the, after a period of initial um, uh, virus coming up, the, um, you, you, the virus goes back to what's referred to as a set point. Um, which is usually a, averages about 10,000 copies of RNA, viral RNA, which is the best way to measure the set point is by looking at viral RNA in, in, in plasma of in, infected people. And about 10, 000, about 10 to 30,000 copies is, is sort of the average level of iremia in an average infected individual. But it can vary from almost undetectable to up to, um, uh, up to a million or more um, in, in some patients. But an average of about 10,000. If you start therapy, this level of viremia declines very, very quickly. And this is the basis for saying that the viruses 
being infection being carried forward constantly by constant infection, reinfection, cells die, you do make no more virus get reinfected. And this occurs, this cycling of this occurs about once a day because the, the, the antiviral drugs don't affect the ability of the virus cell to survive or to make virus themselves. They only affect the ability to get infected. And so what's happening is here is that the cells that are already making virus at the time you start therapy, or most of them are dying very quickly within about a day. And that gives you this one day cycle time and allows for the enormous accumulation of genetic diversity, for example. You then see, you can then see as following the level of virus in, in blood, you can then see a couple of other phases of half-life of about of another longer phase with a half-life of about 20 days, uh, which re reflects a smaller, another population of cells that are much longer lived. Um, and then the, the level of viremia can go down. I'm not going to belabor this point. We've done a lot of work on this. It actually goes down to a, essentially a stable level, which is a, on the order of about three copies, starting with an average of about 30,000 copies. You get about a 10,000-fold decline in, say, eight to 10 weeks of treatment down to what was well below, under, well below the detection limit of standard assays, which is around 20 to 50 copies, standard clinical assays. But with very sensitive assays, you can see a persistent viremia um, at about, um, uh, oh, averaging, averaging about three copies per milliliter or so, um, with about 20% of patients undetectable, even with extremely sensitive assays that we've used in the past. Um, <coughs> This virus, the, all of the evidence indicates, and I'm not going to show you the data on this because I want to get to the material at the end, but all of the evidence that I see indicates that the, this little low-level persistent viremia is due to surviving cells that were infected before you started therapy. And I'll show you actually one piece of evidence that supports this claim. But one, another piece of evidence that supports it is that if you um, take a cohort of patients that have these very low level of viremia, very well suppressed, you add another drug, you get no change at all in this viremia, strongly suggesting that there aren't new cycles of infection going on. You're just, um, you're seeing uh, the, the run out of virus from very long live cells uh, that were infected before therapy, lately infected cells that perhaps are either constantly producing a little bit of virus or are, um, uh, or are occasionally um, go into a, a, what you might call lytic mode, where all of a sudden they start to make virus and then die. We actually don't know what exactly is happening there. It's very hard to get at such a small fraction of cells. In general, in blood, uh, the number of infected cells at any one time in an active infection is about one of CD4 positive T cells, about one in 100 on average. Um, so. Um, and that level, when you start therapy, declines by about tenfold or so and then levels off and stays very steady despite the uh, dramatic loss in RNA. And that tells you that about 10% 10, uh, 10 or so of the infected cells are not on the pathway that's making this RNA. These are latently infected, or probably most of these have actually defective proviruses. And in fact, that's, there's a recent very nice paper, which we will put up on the, uh, uh, on the website. Um, that um, that really makes this point very nicely. Um, <coughs> as I said, no matter when you um, stop therapy, even more than 10 years later, the level of viremia comes back. And remarkably, it actually returns to the level, almost the exact level it was at before, and then levels off. So interrupting therapy even very late. This is not the case with hepatitis C virus, with these, especially with these new treatments, where after uh, a dozen weeks or so, you stop therapy and the virus never ever returns. The patient has been cured, in other words. Right now, as I said, there's only evidence with one person for whom this does not come back. There are some interesting studies that have looked at patients who have been treated very early in therapy, and there may be a few more of those that have this property. But even with those, with that cohort, it's only a very small fraction. So <laughs> if you look in more detail at the level of decay of viremia, we can actually see, I think I mentioned this before, uh, three different, four different uh, phases. There's a very rapid decline with about half-life of a day and a half or so, a longer decline, half-life that's listed here is 28 days. This is, actually, this is real data, the one I showed you before is kind of a cartoon. And then this third phase decline, which has a half-life of about a year, and then finally the virus, what we call phase four decline, but it's actually not a decline at all. We can't distinguish it as different from um, uh, with a, 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 a 
half-life of infinity, so it just goes on and on and on uh, forever, as far as we can tell, this last, this last phase of virus. These are very long live cells. We, we, our, all the evidence we have, these are coming from very long live cells, CD4, resting CD4 positive uh, memory T cells, almost certainly, and uh, which themselves have very long half-lives. And in fact, what I will show you is, uh, from the evidence that I'll show you, what we think is happening here is that these cells become, the steady state is not that these cells are just sitting. These are cells that are being, um, go into a resting state, but are main, whose numbers are maintained by occasional antigen-driven expansion and occasional homeostatic expansion. And every once in a while, that homeostatic or antigen-driven ex expansion will affect, will pick up a cell that has a provirus in it, and that provirus then will be seen to clonally expand, and that's a, a point I will get to in just a minute. Um, and again, you interrupt therapy, and uh, the virus comes right back again. So I'm going to show you a few slides that show what's happening uh, with the genetics of the population genetics of the virus during this time. This will be shown in the in the context of phylogenetic trees, which um, I, I will give a, a, a little bit of explanation of when they come up. So both RNA and DNA decline. Uh, just to summarize, though, RNA and D DNA decline uh, rapidly following the initiation of hard RNA drops 10,000 fold DNA. 10 to 30 fold below pre-therapy values. This implies that only a very small fraction of the viral DNA, DNA positive cells are involved in the production of persistent virus during uh, antiretroviral therapy, actually. Um, and and um, this actually is a very uh, nice paper that came out recently from Bob Silicano's lab at Johns Hopkins. And what they showed is consistent with what I told you in that they looked at, um, cells in patients that um, were incapable, that had HIV proviruses, but were incapable of being induced to make virus. It was an induction assay that they derived some years ago. And um, they, um, what they found is that two things. One is that about 90% of these cells had proviruses that were obviously defective in some way. Big deletions, uh, lots of mutations. Uh, things of that sort. So it's only about 10% of the provirus of the DNA in um, cells that you see on therapy um, are, uh, are even, even look like they're capable of making DNA. What's more, only um, about 5% of the cells that look like they're capable of ma making DNA actually can be induced to do so in, the, in an experimental setting where you do everything you think you know how to induce these proviruses. The proviruses are complete and infectious. They actually showed that by reconstructing them. But they are not, for some reason, they, they, they don't get induced. But maybe they do under some condition in vivo that you just not figured out how to do it. So the problem is really much more severe, in a sense, than, than, than you get from just looking at the DNA. Even though the numbers are very small, uh, proportionately, the tar if you multiply these proportions over the 10 to the 11th or whatever the number is of CD4 cells that, we all, that, that the patient has, uh, the, the total numbers of cells that are involved uh, is actually very large. So, um, so as I warned you, we're going to, I'm going to show you some uh, some phylogenetic trees that um, that address the questions on um, what is this low-level persistent virus due to? Is it due to replication or long-term survival of cells? I already expressed a strong bias toward the second one of these possibilities. Um, can we see evolution of viral or, or DNA or RNA following initiation of, of antiretroviral therapy? What's going on and how can we use this to sort of figure out what's going on with the population of infected cells? And um, if we, um, <coughs> and so we've looked and the, the value, and actually one of the reasons that I sort of took the part-time job at, at NIH was exactly this, was the value of the cohorts of patients and, and uh, samples going back to pre the days before we even had AZT that are still available here at the NIH. And this has allowed some of these studies, these long-term studies, which really begin to tell us um, what's happening. And then um, to the infected cell, to the infected patient, and allow us then to try to think about how uh, we might be able to um, use that information to get toward curative therapy. So this is a phylogenetic tree which I'm sure most of you are somewhat familiar with. The 
um, a very simplified one, uh, but it's actually is these are actually real data, um, uh, just um, just uh, trimmed down a little bit to make it more um, easier to see. Um, and in a phylogenetic tree, the only important dimension is this one, and this shows the genetic distance of any uh, any pair of sequences or any 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 two nodes or branch points between the sequences from one another. So if two sequences are identical, they'll be right next to one another on this tree. And it, to get the distance between any two sequences, you just walk back, uh, sort of count back in this dimension, and then back and over. And so um, you can see, for example, there's another node down here and up here. And these are color coded according to the years in which the samples were taken. So this is in 2000. This is a right just after the patient was infected. And HIV infection is almost always clonal. That is to say, even if there's lots and lots of virus around in whatever the medium that's, that's whether it's semen or blood or, or uh, contaminated inside a contaminated syringe or something like that, um, the, um, it's, it's usually, not always, but usually only a single virus particle makes, the, it makes it through to start the new infection. And so you get a collection of identical sequences early on, and these fairly rapidly begin to evolve away. And you can see that the, um, in 2004, you have this yellow population of virus. And then in 2007, some of the virus, much like the yellow one, is still around. But by the majority of the population has, has moved on. And this is a fairly typical kind of a picture where you can see the evolution of increasing genetic distance with time, um, with, with time of sampling. So if you, if you now look at a patient who's been in, in, infected for a long period of time, so there's very nice diversity, and it's important to remember in a phylogenetic tree that the horizontal distance is only there for the purposes of illustration. Um, it's, it has no meaning whatsoever. You can take any one of these nodes or, and, and flip everything around, and it's still exactly the same tree with exactly the same meaning. So um, it, it, the only thing that's value, of value here is the, the, vertic, the horizontal distance, the vertical distance, as I said, as I meant to say, has no, uh, has no significance. Only the horizontal di distance and that counting back and then back out to the next one, to, to the one you want to compare, gives you the distance between those two. And so you can see this is a very diverse population. There are no two sequences that are alike. And, um, <coughs> and if you look with time, the, the, again, the, the, um, uh, the leaves of this tree or, or the, 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 virus, the individual genomes are coded according to their color-coded according to the time they were taken. Um, and there is no change. It's exactly the same population. And the, the diversity of the population, the measures of all of these distances, pairwise distances between all of these sequences, remains exactly the same, despite a very large drop in the level of virus. Okay. And so even for a year, more than a year, year and a half here, the, um, there is no obvious change in the um, uh, in the diversity of the population. One important thing that that means is now we've seen, got here a 10,000-fold drop or so, um, means that even after 10,000-fold decline in the number of productively infected cells, the, um, there's still a, as much diversity in that population as there was when you started. So we have not, this therapy has not decreased the diversity of the population. So there's still lots and lots of infected cells around. So, however, this pattern does change if you go on out a little ways. So now you go out to whatever we're at, about 60, six years or more here. And now what you start to see in most patients is the appearance of these, these clonal sequences. These sequences, these, these rakes, as they're sometimes called, of identical sequence um, that come up. Uh, this blue point is, is here at about oh, uh, 2,000. 1,900 days or so, and then the orange point is the last point here at uh, 2,200. Um, so what is that, seven years or so? And, um, and, and you see this rake here. There's another little one up, up in here with some background diversity still. And you, you see this in most of the patients occurring with time, but it takes a long time. And so what, we, uh, what I will argue is happening here is that now with time, 
the overall, the, the, the size of this population is not changing over all this time. Remember, both the RNA and the DNA become quite steady here. But what is changing then is the genetic makeup of the population. And what's, what we believe is happening, or we're quite convinced is happening, is that with time, the, the, these resting cells gradually decay, but their numbers are made up by normal homeostatic processes that maintain the total number of cells. But this, this homeostatic process don't affect every resting cell equally. Instead, they pick, they, for some reason or another, sometimes because of antigen and sometimes, who knows, uh, they, they, they will pick, certain cells will be the lucky ones will get picked, and these will then be the ones that expand like this. Now, we're inferring this right now from what we're seeing in the, in the genome RNA in these patients on, suppressed on long-term therapy. This, by the way, is a fairly heroic experiment. It takes, you have to do a lot, a lot of sequences to try to find a few examples uh, when the level of viremia is down at around one copy per milliliter of, uh, per, one copy of RNA per milliliter of plasma. Yeah? Well, the numbers of all kinds of cell bodies main, are maintained by homeostatic processes that, you know, every, every day cells in the liver are dying and they, they're being replaced, but they're not being, they're being replaced by almost exactly the same number of cells, so your liver doesn't get bigger or smaller. And the same thing is true of your metapoietic system, particularly true, where, where you've had all kinds of, of, of events going on during your lifetime of cells expanding because to, to recognize and deal with, with invaders with, an ant, with antigen recognition and so on. Those, at, when that's done, the, the immune system uh, calms down again. Most of the cells that were recruited for this die, a few of them remain as, as resting memory cells. And if that antigen comes along again, they are, they're there and ready to go. Um, but in the meantime, if it, it, the, their numbers are maintained by uh, a homeostatic mechanism, which is one that just maintains the numbers of cells. It just sends a signal. When the numbers of cells begins to get small, it sends a signal. We need a few more of those, and they, they start dividing again. Don't ask me what the mechanism is. I'm not going to be able to explain it. Actually, but actually, in the, in, in a, this HIV infection, in fact, might in fact be useful for studying that process because, as I said, these proviruses are basically random markers of specific cells. And I can tell you something about, can tell you some, following that, you're, you can follow sort of what's happening with randomly selected individual cells that, ex that can be expanded and contracted, and you can follow that by following these provirus patterns. Um, but you're, you're, you're working now right at, the very, right at the very edge of my understanding of immunology, so I try not to go too much farther that way. Um, so, <laughs> um, so the next question that, that we address here is, again, looking at the level of virus, um, if you now stop therapy, and there were, uh, this used to be, a, in, for, for a few years, this kind of treat, uh, treatment interruption was in vogue because there was a theory that it might actually help to stimulate the immune system against the virus. It was called a strategic treatment interruption, or STI. Um, I had some other names for that after um, it was discovered that it really wasn't doing any good to the patients, and in fact, it was a somewhat dangerous thing to do if it wasn't done exactly right because of the possibility of getting drug resistance as a result. Um, but what we, well, when this was done, there were some studies that were done here um, that uh, the, um, <coughs> uh, we got some samples were from, from this. We were able to compare those to pre-therapy samples when, the, when this patient had a high level of viremia and then uh, when, it, when he, um, uh, w had a therapeutic in a therapy interruption at uh, about seven years after the start of therapy was uh, completely suppressed in the meantime. And you can see that there's, unlike the pattern that, that I showed you before, where you have, se after several years, the virus diverges and these branches move out, the, the, the rebound viremia virus really does, fits right into the phylogenetics of, of, the, um, of the virus pre-therapy. And you see, this is another patient. You see two patients here. And these, you really, except for one thing, you would, could not tell which of these was the interruption sample and which of these was the, uh, the pre-therapy sample. So there's been no genetic evolution of the virus during this time. There's been no accumulation of mutations, which characterizes it, and in a sense can clock, serve as a clock for the HIV infection. But what the, the one thing that you can see, though, 
is the appearance of these rakes of sequence again, which you almost never see in, in, in a patient's in samples taken pre-therapy unless they were started very, very early on therapy. Uh, here's one here, here's one here, and one here. But they're not, these aren't any further distant. They have just, uh, again, simplified. Again, um, very much like the, the sort of thing you see here, and that is the same, we, we attribute that to the same thing, saying that the num now the number of cells that are actually infected, the number of different, genetically different cells that, that has, has shrunk, and, and it's shrunk by the expansion of this. And we think, again, this is a combination of sort of very gradual degradation of these cells, followed by randomly selected homeostatic expansion, or perhaps an antigen-driven expansion. We can't tell the difference right now. So, <coughs> So there's no change in diversity or uh, genetic distance uh, up to one year, no increase in genetic distance for many years, but appearance of clonal populations after years on therapy. And uh, the rebound virus has the same properties after the interruption of art. That is to say, no increase in genetic distance, but the appearance of these uh, clonal populations. So again, there's no evidence whatsoever. This supports the claim that I made before for ongoing virus replication in any, any site or any site that, that in, ever uh, feeds virus into the plasma. We don't, we're not doing brain biopsies or something else to see what's going on there. But we think it's very unlikely that any virus replicating to any ex significant extent at any other site in the body, I think it's very unlikely that this would not make its way back into the, in, into the blood to sample from time to time. So now the question is what's happening to the viral DNA in cells? Now, um, remembering that the antiretroviral therapy does not affect the D, does not affect the cell or the viral DNA, the provirus that's already in it, um, and and the answer um, <coughs> here's another patient now um, uh, on therapy the viral RNA goes down to undetectable levels quite quickly as usual. This is just um, a uh, a clinical assay, 50 copy sensitivity. The um, viral DNA trickles down and then pretty much levels off. And then if you look at samples um, during this time, um, during early on therapy, this is, this is a patient actually was treated quite early on therapy. And so there's very little diversity in the virus population pre-therapy. <coughs> so you can't say too much about what has happened um, in terms of virus, uh, rep, viral replication during this time. But one thing that's noteworthy is this sample here. Um, and these now are a collection of viruses, of virus genomes, that um, are identical in sequence. And they're all identical. And they're all obviously, just looking at the sequence, they're all obviously defective. They have stop codons introduced into them. And that's by a, a process called hypermutation, which is due to the action of, of an antiviral factor that we all carry called Avobex3G. Um, I won't go into that, but the important point here is this is not, this virus cannot have been replicating, but yet we saw multiple copies of multiple cells that had this virus in them. So this can only have come from division of one cell that was infected and happened to be infected with this highly defective virus at that time. Okay, so that's one example. So here's another example of a patient who early in infection actually was, had a much more diverse virus population. And again, just like in the RNA, you can see clonal expansion of, um, uh, of uh, both RNA, in fact, and DNA. The RNA in red and the DNA in black, or vice versa. Um, yeah. And um, so the, of RNA clonal expansion, DNA clonal, but, but different clones. So the DNA that we're seeing actually is not giving rise to most of the RNA we're seeing. There's got to be a DNA somewhere in these. In that, but we just, it's giving rise to this virus, but we just didn't sample it in this, in this experiment. Okay. Um, and here's an even more dramatic example where this is huge expansion of DNA uh, in this one patient, um, where I think more than half of the infected cells in blood in this patient at, uh, um, at several time points after therapy, at, at uh, even a year, five years, seven years after, ther after the start of therapy, more than half of the infected cells are the same clone. They have to have come from the same initially infected cell, which was then expanded and expanded and expanded. Quite a dramatic example of this. 
Um, we believe in most cases these cells are, with this clonal expansion are probably have defective viruses in them. And even though, even though there must be clonally infected cells that are giving rise to the RNA, we have most of the time we've been unable to identify those specifically these cells. Or this is, even, even though the numbers of these are much smaller, if you multiply this, this, this could be very large if you multiply it over the total blood volume. So what we think is happening is on pre-therapy, you have these short-lived live infected cells they have, with, with the viral DNA that's being used to make the virus that you see. Um, and then with therapy, a few of these cells, 10% or fewer, um, have defective proviruses, have latently, pro have latently infected proviruses, have other, perhaps other kinds of aberrations that we don't fully understand yet. Um, but these are, and these are not created by therapy, but you strip away all of this and this small fraction of long life cells because revealed by getting rid of all the short life ones that overlie it. They're, they're, they're there all along. It's a very important point to remember. These are there all along, but you don't see them because they're such a small fraction of the total. And then, with that, so this is the total po uh, population pre therapy, and then on therapy. Early on therapy, this is, there are enough of these that you still give a very diverse population of virus. With time, however, they get eroded, and a small fraction of them are, are chosen by some means or another to proliferate, and now you get a, this doesn't show it very well, but now you get a, a clonal expansion of some of these, and, um, and that gives rise to the clonal populations of virus or the clonal DNA samples that we see. So you can see here. And so it's a combination of both of these that maintains the total number of, of, of virus-infected cells. So, so these, are cells, these infected cells are, are revealed but not created by the antiretroviral therapy. Uh, they can include, uh, in one, at least one case, of more than 50% of the proviruses on long-term antiretroviral therapy can be a single clone, which is really quite dramatic if you consider the, the number of cells that are involved here. Uh, they must be maintained at a constant steady state level for many years by combination of erosion and, and homeostatic or antigen-driven replacement. And they most likely, most likely serve as passive markers, perhaps as useful passive markers, for the dynamics of the cells they infect, the memory CD4 positive T cells. And in fact, um, an immunologist might look at this and see what this is a, a, uh, in, in this patient population where they have these kinds of expansion, um, they might actually learn something about what just goes on in normal, although these patients are hardly normal with regarding their CD4 cells, but what goes on in the process of uh, homeostatic or antigen-driven proliferation for memory cells. But I want to finish with a case report that illustrates some of these points. And in some respects, this particular case is a caricature in that there, it, it has a lot of features that are found in normal inf infection, but they're uh, exaggerated in a very, a very interesting way. Um, and this is a patient um, who was probably infected about 1990 um, and started in, in uh, a trial here, um, which, is, which was basically just monitoring uh, the court. Every, every few months, would he would come in for... Um, uh, for sampling, and this is a trial that's been going on now at the clinical center for quite some years. Um, it started running from about 2010 until um, until last year. I'm sorry, but from about 2000 until last year, so covering about uh, 13 years. This is his. Uh, he started with a very high level of viremia, and uh, over 100,000, and then uh, was very well tr handled on therapy, except that during with time for um, various reasons that had, did not have anything to do with experiments but had to do with uh, availability of insurance and, and, and drugs, uh, he, he underwent some periods of interruption. And so you see the viremia comes back again. But in all these times, until the end, it was very well, it, it was very well suppressed. And at the very end of, of the study, uh, the viremia, despite the fact of being on constant uninterrupted therapy, the viremia uh, the virus came back again, and I'll show you. This is, I'll concentrate pretty much on this, but I'll just show you, for the sake of um, uh, of um, completeness, uh, just what happened with this patient in the meantime. So, um, 
early on therapy, you had this the usual pattern of very diverse virus. He'd been infected already probably for some 10 years at this point. Um, and, um, and that, uh, as I showed you before, that did not change with uh, early in therapy. The, the diversity uh, remained, and there was no evidence that it was going anywhere. Again, no, uh, no genetic bottleneck, no sign of, of evolution occurring here. Um, and then um, if you look at this green point here, for example, you can see that um, there was a, uh, uh, an expansion of identical sequences at this point. And then again, out here, there's an expansion of two sets of, 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 uh, of identical sequences at this point later on. And I'll, this is what I'm going to, um, uh, to emphasize. So if you multiply the, the, the number of sequences by the level of number of CD4, infected CD4 cells, um, this, is, this constitutes at any given time about 40 million um, uh, <coughs> cells with, that are making ident uh, about 40 million identical virions being released constantly into, in, in, into blood. So this becomes a steady state of, of viremia. So at this very late time, when, when the level of viremia in this patient began to, began to increase, um, we sampled this and we found actually two interesting populations of virus. One of these uh, had obvious resistance mutations to two of the three antiretroviral drugs that he was getting. These are, these are very, the two most famous actual uh, resistance mutations. 184 is, is resistance mutation to uh, lamivudine or uh, 3TC, which is a nucleoside analog, uh, K103N is, confers very high level resistance to efavirenz, which is a non-nucleoside RT inhibitor. So this was a population, and this was a population that was diversifying, probably arose fairly recently out of a clone, and its origin probably um, dates back to during the therapeutic interruptions, um, which allowed the, this is a not an uncommon story, which allowed the, uh, this virus to, uh, uh, to, to, be, to uh, allow a chance resistance mutation to arise and be selected during the course of the low level drugs that were in the patient. And, um, <coughs> and so this, uh, which, would, which would be right back here at this, at this node, and so this then uh, we would postulate was replicating and diversifying. However, there was at the same time, in a more or less equal amount, a drug-sensitive virus um, that, showed, uh, that showed no sign of resistance mutations and was an, a completely identical rate of, of viremia. This, we would guess, was due to a, uh, uh, a, a virus that was produced by a clone of infected cells, um, all of which were releasing the, the same virion. And in fact, with this patient, we were able to test that because of this resistance, it was um, decided uh, to, uh, to shift, switch therapies to um, a, um, a combination therapy that uh, well, included um, uh, raltegravir and ropivirine um, and um, was uh, like a very, one of, one of the, uh, the great things about modern HIV therapeutics is we have such a large armamentarium that in fact, Patients who do get resistant like this can be shifted to very effective salvage therapies and go back and sort of resume their lives. And, and there are many, many success stories using this kind of a strategy to, on, on patients who do become resistant to first-line therapy. But that's, that's a side note here. So that gave a, that in fact was, was reasonably successful, gave a, a partial um, uh, reduction of the level of viremia in this patient. Um, and this patient also at the same time had, um, was diagnosed with a cancer, explanus cell carcinoma was treated for that. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but the important thing is here, we did sequencing analysis on this patient. This is what I showed you before, and it, where it had these two populations, this wild type relative to drug resistance and this resistance mutation. And then from this point here, this blue point, you can see now it's partially down. You can see that the wild type is the predominant. There's only a few of these left. And then when we get out to here, this drug-resistant virus is completely gone. The only the wild type survives. So this is a very nicely controlled, internally controlled, that shows that the therapeutic switch um, indeed cleared the, um, uh, cleared the 
by the drug resistant mutant virus because it wasn't resistant to the drugs we put in, but this wild type virus remained completely uh, insensitive to um, to the therapy. Again, consistent with the idea not that it's re it's not replicating virus; it's just due to um, in, in previously infected cells. So um, the, um, <coughs> the the viremia initial viremia consisted of clade of both identical drug se sensitive sequences and diverse drug resistant sequences that can persist, in, implying two sources of viremia, replicating virus and an expanded clone of, of HIV infected cells, cells se infected with drug sensitive HIV. Consistently, the drug resistant virus was eliminated by changing to an effective therapy. And um, the, the, there may have been some contribution of immune activation and tumor specific immune response to this clonal expansion. So, What's actually driving this clonal expansion? Uh, is there a driver of this clonal expansion relative to the virus? And here's the surprising result, I promised you. Um, and to get at this, uh, we took advantage of the fact that our colleagues up at the drug resistance program, particularly Steve Hughes and uh, his collaborator, Shaolin Wu, have been working for some years on looking in great detail at integration sites in HIV infection. And they were doing that because they were trying to figure out how to modify this process for things like gene therapy and so on. And they developed wonderful assays uh, for um, looking at the distribution of integration sites. Remember, integration sites, for this purpose, we will consider to be essentially random in the infected cell. So there are billions of possible ones. And so, and, and the integration site uniquely marks a specific event at a specific time when that cell, when that cell encountered the virus. Um, and so the question is, what is the nature of the distribution of the integration sites in this patient? And also, to what extent um, can we see the expansion of specific cells at a specific, specific integration sites? And is there anything interesting about where the integration sites are in the expanded cells? So we start with the cells, extract DNA. The trick here is to shear the DNA. Shearing of DNA, just this is with a sonic, this is done with a sonicator, a very fancy, inexpensive sonicator, but a sonicator nonetheless. Um, that makes a variety of pieces that can be selected to be quite a, a near uniform size, in this case around 500 base pairs. The shear points are random. It's not like cutting it with a restriction enzyme. It's, it, they're, they're really extremely random. And so the given shear point marks the cut of a specific molecule. Okay. So if you have a molecule that has the same shear, has the same sequence in it, but two different shear points, that has to have come from two different cells. You can't have the same molecule being two different sizes in this, in this sample, even in PCR. So what, it, what is then done, so if you now visualize the HIV integration site, so you take off the end of the provirus, this block, box here marks the LTR. What you're interested in is identifying both the exact site where the integration is and where the other end, where, where the DNA was sheared. And so you, that's done by, this is now just an expanded view of that. You, so you have the LTR that flanks the DNA. Uh, you have the breakpoint that you sheared. You ligate on a linker to this end that you can now use for PCR amplification. You use a common sequence here near the end of the provirus to mark the, uh, uh, to, to amplify with, what did I just do? And you then, um, you then amplify all of the all of the fragments that have these have have an end with a linker on it and ha have an LTR here, okay. And then you can sequence using um, the, this miraculous uh, Lumina sequencing, or where um, uh, you can then get millions and millions and millions of those total sequences. You sort through those, looking for ones that you can identify as being from the cell DNA and having the right integration site. And then you ask, how many do you have that have the identical integration site and a different site here? You can't just count what you see in the PCR assay because different PCR mole different molecules are PCR amplified at very different efficiencies. And so you can't just count the number of sequences you get that have this junction on them, because that's meaningless. But the number that have this and a different integration site here tells you the minimum number of cells that must have been present in that DNA preparation to begin with that have an integration at this site. Okay, And you can do the same thing at the other end. And this is a slightly complicated uh, figure, but what, what I show here is the number of times, number of different breakpoints that have each of these 
different um, particular integration sites. So each bar is an integration site. Its width is proportional to the total number of sequences. Its height is proportional to the total number of fragments that you get. The colored ones, the red ones here, are all in a single gene. Furthermore, they're all in a single intron of a single gene. And that intron, I'm going to show it to you in a second, but I'll tell you right now, that intron is only three and a half kilobases long. It's only about a third the size of the provirus itself. And it only represents one one millionth of the total cell DNA. This just shows that the same data plotted another way. These are the integrations that are seen only once. Only one cell, uh, cells worth of DNA in the preparation had an integration at these sites. These are ones that are slightly expanded. You see them twice. It means that cell had to have been expanded a little bit. And then these are ones, these, this, this wedge here is ones that were expanded 8 to 30 fold. MKL2 is the most prominent. It's paralog, actually. MKL1 was also found a number of times. Then a chromosome X sequence is not in a gene. And then a gene called Box2, and then a couple of others. And I'll show you those. I'll show you two of these. So these are the MKL2 integration sites. They're within the same intron. Here's the whole gene, about 200 kilobases long. Each of these small vertical lines represents an exon, a, a coding sequence. Like most genes, it's almost all introns. The, the exons represent only a small fraction. If you do an inf HIV infection of cells in vitro, in tissue culture, this is the pattern of integrations you see, with the arrow indicating the direction of the provirus, one way or the other. And you can, so these are scattered across the gene and more or less ran at random orientation, which is what you expect. There's no way the proviral integration machinery can know which way the DNA is transcribed. However, when you look in this one intron, 3.5 three kb, one one millionth of the total cell DNA has attracted um, uh, 78 hits out of 945 at 16 unique sites, actually 14, there's another two that are just outside it. 14 sites have integrations all in the same orientation. This is not due to the specificity of integration. This is due to the cells that have independently been infected during the course of patient, we, we believe before therapy, having been somehow selected for expansion. So although this is sort of random homeostatic expansion, there's something about integrations at this site that cause that cell that happens to have them to be much more likely to be expanded than all of its friends that don't have this. It's as though the, um, the, the, an antigen, say, or uh, a, a signal for expansion comes along, and cells that have this particular integration, which has to be in some way affecting the expression of this gene, Say, they raise their hands and say, pick me, pick me, pick me, and then sure enough, they get picked. And so these are the lucky survivors that get to be expanded. And, um, and, and so we see these as this remarkable cluster. This is now, what, 15%, uh, more than 15% of the total integrants are in this, in this are within this one one millionth of the cell DNA. Even the probability of they're all being in the same orientation is, uh, about 0.005 or something like that. That's it. All, all in the same orientation. And in the cell culture infection, you don't you, you see out of 200,000, so one in 100,000 integrations are in this exon six in cell culture. This is not. This is a somewhat. This is actually a somewhat more frequent target than random, but not by that much. So, and the same thing happens in this other gene called Box two, and in that case. Again, all of the, this, this collection of integrations are in the same intron in this gene, which is here. This is a much bigger intron, it's 80 kilobases. <clears throat> and um, or all but two are in this intron, the other two are very near it. And all again in the same orientation, in the same, in the same direction as transcription of this gene, which is, which is in this direction. In the HeLa cell experiment, the in vitro experiment, only four out of 200,000 were were in this um, gene, and they were all kind of in a little cluster here. <coughs> so these two genes have actually been identified with, um, with certain cancers. So this is a, a nuclear transcriptional coactivator. 
which has been in, implicated in, 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 in certain cancers or cancer-like conditions. And uh, this one is also a transcription factor, also implicated in certain cancers as marked by point sites of chromosomal breakage and reunion. And the same thing is true here. So these genes like this, these genes have actually been seen in a couple of other published studies, again, with very small numbers of integration sites, but yet genes in the same intron, in the same orientation, have been seen in a number of other published studies and a few that have been published since then. And also, we also see an expansion of other genes that have also been uh, reported in others. So, um, <clears throat> So population of identical sequences can contribute to the clinically detectable viremia in antiretroviral therapy. HIV, and this is all from this one case now, and this is compared to a couple of others. But HIV infected cells undergo clonal expansion in all four out of four patients that we studied. The um, clonally expanded lineages can persist for more than 12 years. I didn't show you these data, but we can see some of these integration sites, at least one of these integration sites in this patient from a sample that was taken uh, right around the start of therapy, 12 years earlier. Um, clonal expansion is, well, has to be a consequence of the integration sites. I just can't think of another argument, an, an argument against that. Um, and it almost certainly relates to LTR-driven expression, although there are some other possibilities that relate to the way. If you were, uh, if, if you were working on retroviral oncogenesis, the retroviruses, cancer models, animal retroviruses, ML, murine leukemia virus, and avian uh, leukemia viruses, cancer models, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, you would have said, well, this is exactly what you see. These are, these are exactly what it looks like in a chicken that's infected with avian, avian leukosis virus, for example, that has gotten a, a leukemia as a result, or a mouse that's been infected with murine leukemia virus. You see these integrations within or outside of proto-oncogenes that are driving the expression of those, or deranging the expression of those in some way that causes the cell to become a cancer cell. These are clearly not cancer cells that we're looking at here. Who knows what they might become if you give them another some years, but they're not, because you see many clones of cells that have the same thing, that can't be a cancer cell itself because you'd only see one. Um, and there's no, there was no evidence for any um, malign uh, malignancy, hematopoietic malignancy in this patient, even though he did have a squamous cell carcinoma at the time. So we're currently trying to match, ma to, to make all the pieces fit, to match these expanded clones with the, viral RNA sequences that we can see, and this is proving to be a very difficult thing. I think most of these are probably defective. Proviruses are probably defective in some way, which is also good for the, good for the cell that has them because then um, they won't be expressing antigens that, to which the immune response might react, for example. And I will close there. Thank lots and lots of people, particularly here um, at, uh, at the CCMD, which was already mentioned earlier. It's for, Henry, Henry's Institute. In fact, I think Henry's even on here, isn't it? Um, and uh, right there. And um, also John Mellers and collaborators at the University of Pittsburgh. Many people in the drug resistance program, Steve Hughes and Zhaolin Wu did the integration site studies. He, Frank, Frank Maldarelli and, and his, 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 his team uh, from the clinical retrovirology section of the drug resistance program and Mary Gurney and her team from the translational research unit. Um, and of course, uh, as always, we uh, are extremely grateful for the participation of the, patient, participation of the patients in these studies. Unfortunately, I can't thank the, the, the last of the patients in person since he, just, he died about a year ago uh, from, the, from the cancer that I mentioned. And um, a few more are just repeat again, but show you this lovely picture of this Massachusetts cranberry harvest. And, that's my, that I, own, I have also as a part-time job. And I'll close here and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, amazing. Do we have some questions or We have a few over comments? here. Yes. I actually have a question about, you know, other possible reservoir cells for HIV in these patients. Do you track those at all or just the CD4? We have done a little bit with other cells. We we have a study going on now with looking at at, at gut biopsies, for example, um, that <coughs> and looking at the sequence of the virus in those and looking at integration sites in those. Um, it, the um, uh, there is quite a bit of discussion about, as you probably are aware, about what is the nature of possible nature of other other reservoirs. 
in my opinion, which is not shared by everybody in the field, in my opinion, the population of reservoir cells, with the exception of the CNS, um, is, is probably quite well stirred. That is to say, if you go looking at gut biopsies, a different problem. One of, one of the things that, that's ongoing with, um, uh, with Frank's um, uh, group is to take um, gut biopsies, and instead of just pooling everything you get in one, from one colonoscopy, since you get, I don't know, a couple of dozen uh, SNPs, looking at each of the SNPs individually and asking whether the, the population you see here, you see here, you see here, is the same as the virus population that you see in, in, in other things you can sample in, in lymph nodes and in, uh, and in plasma. And the early evidence on this, and I was emphasized this very early, suggests that actually it's very much the same population of the genetic population of virus in all of these sites. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, yeah. you, you have mentioned at some point that uh, some viruses are drug resistant and drug sensitive. Mm -hmm. So the drugs that are used for this study is a host factor dependent or design drugs, or they are, are they are, have function on a specific uh, integrate. I mean, specific uh, point in its life cycle. Uh, the the drugs process. that were used are off the shelf antiretrovirals. Um, the patient was taking. Mostly the, the one pill uh, in, the, in, the, in the picture that was shown earlier, uh, the, the, um, and um, it, was, it was very routine therapy. The, the, they consisted, the initial therapy that, that the patient I was on for most of the study um, was a mixture of efavirenz, uh, tenofovir, and uh, 3TC, or uh, yeah, it was 3TC. It wasn't quite the one pill combination, but it might, but it might as well have been. It was equivalent to that. And, um, and that was very standard antiretroviral therapy. They're all reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Two of them are nucleoside analogs, and one of them is a, a non-nucleoside a non inhibitor, uh, uh, a, uh, a compound that binds to and, and blocks the motion of um, reverse transcriptases it's trying to, to copy. So he was then switched to a combination that included a protease inhibitor and a, and a, uh, and, and an integrase inhibitor. But they, they're all so they're all targeted at specific points in the virus life cycle. But these are these are really just all right off right off the shelf for antiretrovirals. There's nothing sort of exploratory or novel in them. So I have one more question. I mean, uh, at certain point, means when you are stop treating the HIV patients, so the level of HIV virus goes up. So uh, in a in any cell, they have called uh, host restriction factors, mm -hmm. and some of them are host to, I mean, promoting factors. So what is the level there? The host restriction factors totally stop functioning at that point? Uh, well, they're all functioning. That whole system is clearly functioning. One, an important point is that you have a, a set point of viremia before you start therapy. You go to therapy, you reduce the viremia for 10,000 fold or more. Uh, you keep it that way for 10 years. Uh, you stop therapy, and you go right back to where you were. It's really quite remarkable. So whatever the pattern, whatever, so, and and the, the, the amount of replication is, is a balance of all kinds of things. The, 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 the extent to which restriction factors can play into this, the extent to which they're expressed in the patient, for example, the, uh, the nature of the immune response, the, 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 um, uh, the MHC type of the patient plays into this. Um, all of those factors come into play even after all this time on therapy, exactly the same way they did before. So you get, you, you get exactly the same balance between the virus and the patient. It's really quite remarkable, actually. Thank you. I just want to confirm. You said integration of the, um, into the intron of the gene actually induces the expression of that gene? It can. OK. It's not, certainly not. It, it, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the nature of how the expression of that gene is controlled to begin with and whether, whether in fact, adding new transcription factor binding sites in the middle can, can enhance the expression. But it can also terminate. Yeah, I would have thought it would You also introduce it. a poly A site. It can actually serve as a terminator for the gene and truncate. You get a truncated product. But and there are, examples from the, there, are examples, there are examples from animal cancer models of, of, of quite a number of different ways, actually, with this, at which integration can affect the expression of a gene in a way that can then affect the, uh, uh, the cell cycle of, the, of that particular cell and its regulation, giving rise to cells that eventually become cancer cells. Uh, we don't know what's going on in this case. It's actually, we've been talking about it and talking about it 
but we're, we're talking about um, about 15 percent of a population that amounts to about one cell in a thousand to begin with. So it's on the order of one cell per 6,000 in circulation has this. So it's really kind of hard to get that particular cell and ask about the expression of any given gene. I, we haven't quite figured out a, a nice way to do that. John, can I ask you a question? The long-lasting cells that are maintaining uh, these clones, what, what are they? Well, we're, we're, re we're quite sure. The, the experiment I showed you is actually done on sor cells that were sorted for CD4. Actually, they were sorted against everything else. So we, like everybody else, believes that the, almost everybody else, believes the important reservoir is resting CD4 cell. But we have no, no. So have these cells been immortalized? They just last for a long time. I mean, the, the immune system is clever. It's designed, and they're, they're in a sense functionally immortal because I said they're maintained. They, they, they do slowly degrade, Yeah. but then they're maintained by, uh, by the, the degradation gives rise to some kind of a homeostatic signal. Maybe there's an immunologist in the audience who can explain that better than I can. I'm sure I, there is actually. I, mean, I was completely the odds unaware are pretty high. that the immune system and had such yeah, uh, we we, we have we we have recall responses to antigens that we encountered as children. And and how do you know there aren't comparable cells outside of the circulating mononuclear? Oh yeah, there there probably are. So uh, why aren't but they, they also residues? Of, you 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 made the comment from your. I I I, th I believe that the cells move around actually that they they. they that that and th that these kinds of experiments can be used to provide evidence for that because they so you these can tag these cells and you can see them you can see them here and there. And other people have found that too. Have found exactly the same um, a, a highly defective provirus. My former colleague Sarah Palmer has published this. Found exactly the same provirus in uh, in in TBMCs from blood as well as in biopsy samples from other tissues. And if that provirus is defective, it cannot have gotten around by infecting cells. It can only have gotten around Are by that cell in growing. Glial cells and in I don't think they found it in glial cells. I think they're all CD4 cells, but they're from different sites. But as far as looking at other cells, <coughs> the, the, nicer, the nicer way to do that experiment is in things like um, rhesus monkey models. The problem with rhesus monkey models is compared to patients. The good thing is you can take samples from anywhere in the body at any time you want. The bad thing is, these experiments take a long time because you have to treat for a long time before you, you've exposed enough of this population to be able to deal with. And also you want to start, because you use the genetics of the virus as a marker, you want to start with a very diverse population of virus, which usually means waiting a long time after infection. Um, unlike patients, monkeys are very expensive. I mean, patients are expensive, but monkeys are really expensive. And so the, 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 the use of that model to advance this aspect of this. It's been very important for other things, but the use of that model to advance this aspect of the field lags behind for that reason. It's just that the, the experimentation is so lengthy and expensive. So in one of your slides, you showed that there was clonal expansion mm -hmm. due to integration. So do you think that HIV-based vector means uh, uh, used for uh, gene therapies? I think, I think we have to think about that. Okay. That HIV, for those that don't know, retroviral vectors, I use retroviruses, I, I use retroviruses as the correct way to include HIV. Retroviral vectors are um, <coughs> getting more and more popular and have been in fact effective in, in, um, in, some, in some special uh, circumstances uh, to accomplish gene therapy and gene, re gene replacement, for example, in, in severe combined immunodeficiency. Um, but, uh, and, the, and the first generation of these were derived from, from murine leukemia virus. In fact, were derived from a virus that was specifically selected originally for its ability to cause cancer. Thinking about it, that might not have been the best choice because it turns out that in a number, I think about 25% of the treated boys, at least that was the number last I heard, um, had come down with uh, lymphoma associated with integration in, the, in, a, in a specific, mo mostly in a specific intron of a gene uh, called LMO2, which had been associated with cancer in mouse models. And, um, and so that's a clear, unpleasant side, nasty side effect. I think all of them are all but one, if somebody can remind me, uh, were suc apparently successfully treated with standard anti-cancer drugs. But 
it, it has been postulated because nobody has yet clearly shown that um, HIV associated malignancies are also are due to the HIV itself. It's generally accepted that almost all of them, Kaposi's sarcoma, for example, it was discussed earlier, um, are due to the uh, immunodeficiency allowing replication and infection with another virus like Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. Um, that HIV infection itself is, is, it does not drive um, um, uh, oncogenic uh, expression of, of, of proto-oncogenes. But it's, that's based on negative evidence and it's based on actually lack of, in, in a sense, a non-observation bias. People haven't looked very hard for that either. So I think that issue, given these results, I think that issue needs to be revisited. And do you think that the integration sites like they are playing role in clonal expansion, they play a role in latency, that which cells will be selected? I, 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 think that's, I think that's likely that there are integration sites that are, that tend, uh, that there's something about the flanking DNA, the chromatin structure, whatever, is, tends to, tends to uh, favor latency. But people have actually tried to look for that, haven't had much success in really pinning that down. Um, and so that re it remains an open question, but I think it's certainly a possibility. Just one last question. In one of your slides, you want to yeah. Go okay. Yeah. No, so everybody can go home if they want. <laughs> <laughs> in one of your slides, actually, it was nice talk. In one of your slides, you said that 16 plants are originally integrated. 